from South Philly to the Alamo and even Greece, from being a trumpet player to taking Venus to the top of the charts as a vocalist. Hi, I'm Ernie Manous. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Frankie Avalon. Is it still fun? Yeah, <laughs> it's Why? always fun. Why? It's been Since so many kid. years of doing. I don't this. know. I uh, I don't know anything else but, you know, and I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Take me back to when it all started. Because looking at your career, I think that the most amazing thing is that you were so young when you established yourself with the songs you sing and all, that, and it's followed you now your entire life. So those decisions made early are still with you. Well, actually, it really wasn't my decision. All of this that's happened to me came about. I mean, I was in a, on a different direction, you know. I started out as a musician. Right. So I'm a trumpet player. And I studied uh, with the Philadelphia Orchestra. I had a scholarship to Eastman School of Music. I was going to play legitimate trumpet. But I got sidetracked because in the... Summer times, I would play these little rock and roll places with bands, and uh, somebody said, we want to sign your band to a, to a record contract, and we want you to sing, which I used to do a little bit of singing. So I got you know, into this not by really choice. I said, sure, how much money can I make? And they said, well, if you hit, you make a lot of money. I said, I'll try it. <laughs> do you ever wonder what had happened if you hadn't gone with the bands, if you hadn't done the singing route? Um, I was determined to play my horn. I mean, I really loved it. And I probably would have continued on playing trumpet and uh, where that would take me, that I don't know. Maybe I would have been an orchestra player. Yeah. I don't know. Do you still play? No. Really? No. It's the most frustrating <laughs> instrument in the world. I mean, it it's, it's takes so much dedication, so much practice that because of what I've done and do, I don't have time to play anymore. Yeah. And, you know, your priorities, all of a sudden you get involved into uh, singing and, 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 and dates and concerts and then movies. And time, you must have time for yourself to relax. And, of course, trumpet playing and practicing is very demanding. And I found something else that took me away from the horn, which I... I had as much dedication to, and it was a game of golf. So <laughs> that just took me away. So now your free time is golfing. Yeah. Okay, Philly in the late 50s. So much music came out of that era. Why? Boy, I wish I knew. Uh, I have no idea. I, all I know is Philadelphia has been uh, a city that has produced from way back. I mean, even before... Frankie Avalon or Bobby Rydell or James Dare and Chubby Checker and Eddie Fisher and Mario Lanza. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And Al Martino um, from the Barrymore's, you know, theater. Uh, it's always been a city that has been very musical and produced lots of people. Not only people that have been in front of the camera, um, wonderful directors, writers, um, creative people. It's, it's always been a very active, um, creative city. You mentioned El Martino. And if I remember correctly, and as I've read it, you were an uninvited guest to one of his parties, and that's where you first made the right contacts. What's the story there? Yeah, well, that was it, and I, I really do... How are you an uninvited guest? Let's start there. Uninvited <laughs> guest, okay. See, when you live in a neighborhood in Philadelphia, I come from an area called South Philadelphia, uh, it's a great community of all ethnics, uh, uh, kinds of people. And it's row houses and little tiny streets, and everybody knew one another and a very friendly kind of an atmosphere. Al Martino was a big star back in 1951. I was about uh, 11 or 12 years old. And I had heard that uh, he was going to be at someone's house in the neighborhood, one of the row houses, 
And there were crowds outside of this house waiting to get a glimpse of Al Martino. Well, I had been playing my trumpet for about a year, and I played very well. And I went to the front, squeezed my way through with my trumpet in my hand, and I knocked on the door, and uh, the owner of the house uh, said, yeah, and I said, my name is Frank Avalone. I play trumpet. I like to play my horn for Mr. Martino. And the guy looked at me and he said, come on in. Really? So now there was a lot of activity, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. at this party, and while everybody's partying and drinking and eating, I take out my trumpet, and I played. And it was like in a movie, you know, all of a sudden it was shh, 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 shh. And when I finished, the entire people in the party applauded. And Al Martino came over to me with the man who owned the house, and he said, what's your name? I said, Frank Avalone. Where do you live? I said, I live up the block. And Al Martino said, Jesus, he plays great. He says, um, do you know his parents? He said, no, but I'll get to know them. <laughs> so they finally meet my parents, and Al Martino says, I want to take him to New York. I want him to uh, uh, do an, uh, an introduction to one of the biggest uh, agencies, an audition. So I go to New York, and my mother and father allow me to go with the, our neighbor there and Al Martino. And I walk into this big agency, and uh, as they're talking, take out my horn, <laughs> and I play. And uh, the agent, they applaud. The agent says, I got a great idea. Jackie Gleason loves trumpet. Let's take him. He's at the Sheridan Hotel. He lives there. He's got the penthouse. So we go to the Sheraton Hotel, and we meet the director and the producer and the writers are all there, but Jackie's not there. It was a, a, a two-story uh, penthouse, of course. And I take out my horn, and I play. And halfway through, I see Jackie Gleason, as I'm playing, come out on the top floor, and I finished, and they applaud, and Gleason says, write a show, I want him on in two weeks. Wow. So that was really my introduction. And because of that, I became child prodigy. And I started recording for RCA Victor. There are some records around. If you can find them. I mean, uh, It was the X label, and it was 78s. And that got me started into, uh, into... So Al Martino really is the guy who gave me my first first real break. One thing that comes from that story that I wonder what you think about is success when you make it in this business, how much of it is luck and chance, and how much is it, of it is preparation and being ready? Well, listen, I was ready. I really, uh, I, I, I loved that trumpet so dearly. I mean, I, I would play, and it's, of course I mentioned, you know, living in a neighborhood of row houses. I mean, you, you could not imagine how many times people would say, shut up, kid, keep quiet. You know? I mean, I played four or five hours a day at least, and in summertime, you know, being a kid in that neighborhood at the time, you know, there was no air conditioning. If you got a fan, you were lucky, you know. I mean, I would sit in the bathtub in cold water and just, just play. I just loved to play. Yeah. So I played very well. So when did you realize you were going to go the singing route? I didn't. I mean, it was not my choice. It was, you know, it was somebody who came in at the right time, at the right place, looking for new young talent, and I happened to be with this group called Rocco and His Saints. And I played my horn, I was the trumpet player, and I used to sing three or four songs. And the only reason why I did three or four songs is because Rocco said to me, I, I maybe would sing one song, two songs. So Rocco said to me, people like when you sing. I said, oh, okay, I'm a trumpet player, you know. He said, I want you to sing more songs, learn some more songs. I said, wait a minute, I'm a trumpet player. You hired me as a trumpet player. He said, um, I'll give you five bucks a week more. <laughs> I said, you got it. So you did this for five bucks yeah. a week, and look how it turned uh -huh. out. Yeah. yeah. And then recording-wise, you hit pretty quick. With the yeah, I did. Um, I mean, I had some records that came out that were not uh, instant hits. Right. I mean, I had songs like um, Shy Guy and ooh la la and some things that went out there that uh, that didn't happen but what did happen 
was that when I did go out there and promote, and my manager who started me, uh, who found this group and then extracted me from the group, was named Bob Marcucci. And Bob had a belief in me, and uh, after I had had Ooh La La and a couple of things that were not hits, there was a big, big show in Boston at the Mechanics Hall. And, uh, and Bob Marcucci went to, the, the disc jockey's name was uh, Wu Wu Ginsburg uh, and, and Joe Smith. And they were putting on this big, big show with Chuck Berry and Fats Domino and whoever was hot there. And he went to them and said, uh, I'd like for you to put Frankie Avalon on the show. And they said, well, he doesn't have a hit record. And he said, you don't even have to pay him. Just, just put him on. I just, I just want to see what's going to happen. So they agreed to do that. So Bob took me into a clothing store and he bought me a suit for 12 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and we drive to Boston uh, from Philly, and he puts me on uh, the show. And in the middle of the show, I, I sing whatever song that I was promoting at the time, which was not a hit, but I made sure I played my trumpet because that was my security blanket. Mm -hmm. So I did the, the song as a vocalist, but I made sure that I finished with, with playing my horn. And... Uh, after that two or three days of this show that went on for two, three days, every time I would come out of the stage door, it started to grow. More kids wanted autographs. Do you have a fan club? Do you want to? Then they started, you know, getting, want to touch, and they want. So, so Bob Marcucci said, Jesus, we don't have a hit, but you got something that these kids like. And I think from there on in is where he, he had a vision for me. And, uh, Finally, he said, I had one more song to do on the contract. And uh, he took it upon himself with his partner to write my first hit song, which was called Dee Dee Dinah. And that's another story. But uh, story about that that I've heard. You didn't like the song. You sang it holding your nose. True or false? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to realize, you know, I'm a musician now. I mean, I'm studying... I'm first chair of all city orchestra, and I'm, uh, now I'm doing these rock and roll things. And uh, I go in to do this last record, and I hear ba 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 da ba 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 da ba 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 da ba. Everything was staccato, and ba 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 I'm, you know, the band is rehearsing, and then I start to do a few takes on it. In those days, you didn't have, you know, you did it live. You know, you had like one one track or whatever. And I started going, and so they said to me, Pete DeAngelis, who was the A&R man, said, what do you do? I said, I'm just going to, it sounds staccato to me. He said, let's make a few like that. I said, sure, why not? There is no girl that is fine. And uh, finally, I go back with the band. You know, I'm still making that extra five bucks a week there. And about two weeks later, Bob Marcucci calls me and he says, get out of the band, you got a hit record. <laughs> wow. I said, you're kidding. I, I just couldn't believe it. You know, it just, uh, then it started to take off. Do you remember hearing yourself for the first time on radio? Yeah, I didn't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of critics didn't like it either. Yeah. But, <laughs> but the kids liked it and they bought the record and it was a top ten record, top five record, I think. Wow. And then, of course, Venus. Well, no, then, then follow. Now, 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 right. now what do you do? You got a sound, right? So, right. Geez, what am I going to do now? A nasally So they bring me a song, sound. and I got to do again. So I sing, gingerbread, 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 and I'm saying, <laughs> what am I doing? So then they started to kind of, kind of get me out of that, and they, they did a nice little romantic ballad called I'll Wait for You, and then I think the next song after that was... Uh, I think it was Venus after that. And then Venus kind of changed everything. This was a wonderful song. Yeah. When you recorded it, did you have any idea all these years later you'd still be with it? Venus? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, really? I knew it immediately. What was it about it? I knew it that, that song was a, was a smash. I got so excited about that song. When I went into New York to record it, and I, I, I didn't hear the arrangement, of course, but I just loved the song. And Pete DeAngelis, who was, did all my records, uh, 
said, the arrangement is fantastic. And I said, we haven't heard it yet. He said, I wrote it. I heard it. <laughs> so we go into the studio, and I listen to this thing, and I sing. And like I said, we did seven takes on it because you, you, you couldn't stop and piece and do what they do today. I did seven takes on it, and uh, it was a three-hour session. I did some other stuff. And I waited until 4 o'clock in the morning for the acetate because I wanted it. And we drove back to Philly, and I took it into my house. And years ago, I had one playing trumpet, a hi-fi set. (laughs) So I had a hi-fi set. So I get in at 6 o'clock in the morning. I didn't sleep all day. I just played it over and over and over. I just yeah. felt that song. I knew it. Okay, at some point, you're stepping away from the music career and you're going into film. Why? Why not? <laughs> uh, why? Uh, in, in those days, uh, what happened was studios became very much aware of singers. Elvis. Mm-hmm. Elvis uh, started making films in about 57, maybe, 56, 57. So studios start to get the idea that, you know, these singers have a following and have fans, and they are dedicated. I would, I would receive, oh, I don't know, 12,000 pieces of mail per week. That's a lot of mail. Um, so they knew that I had a fan base. So Warner Brothers uh, was going to do a picture called Guns of the Timberland uh, with a star who was kind of a, he was a big star, major star, but kind of fading at this point. His name was Alan Ladd. And the producer of the film was a writer, and this was his first uh, job as a producer, and that was Aaron Spelling. So... They make contact with my manager, and they say, we want Frankie Avalon to be introduced into motion pictures in the picture Guns of the Timberland, starring Alan Ladd. And, of course, that was my first film in 1958. And uh, it was quite an experience for me. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Tell me about Alamo. Alamo. Um, that came because of doing Guns of the Timberland. Again, John Wayne was one to use singers. Rick Nelson was in Rio Bravo. Mm -hmm. And then I was the second, I think, singer, and then he used Glenn Campbell and Bobby Vinton and so forth. So he was doing this picture of the Alamo, and uh, there was a part of the guy who takes the message to General Sam, who's a young guy, And uh, my agency at the time, along with my manager, knew about the Alamo that was going to be made and said, recommended me for the role of uh, Smitty. And uh, Wayne said, let me see some of his film because my film had not come out yet. So he looked at some of the rushes and things. He said, yeah, I like him. Let's get him for this picture. So I went to uh, Brackettville, Texas for four months in the middle of nowhere and I'm from the streets of South Philadelphia, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I didn't know, I mean, to see any kind of an animal to me was, except a cat or a rat, you know. <laughs> but this was really an experience for me. And I was there for like five months shooting the Alamo. And I loved it. I mean, John Wayne, the Duke, was great to me. And uh, Richard Widmark was a wonderful man. And the whole cast and probably the best of the lot when it comes to... Uh, all these uh, wranglers and, and stuntmen. It's a great, great experience. Why do you think you weren't, and maybe you were, but from your stories and the way you tell it, why weren't you overwhelmed in these situations? I mean, to be playing your horn and Jackie Gleason walks in the room, I would flub up. You know, to be in a movie, your second movie out with John Wayne. I mean, how did you get through it? I just did it. I don't know. Uh, I probably would be a nervous wreck now. <laughs> <laughs> But I think when you're young, when you're a kid, you know, you just got, you know, there's dreams, you know, you have to have dreams. And when I was a boy, you know, growing up in that neighborhood there, you know, your mother would give you a little 
bag of lunch, you know, with meatballs or something. You go into a movie. She puts you in the movie all day on a Saturday afternoon, and you watch these people, and these were, you know, magnificent homes and stars and people. And you always have that in the back of your mind. I'll bet you everybody does. Like the kids with rock stars, you know. Everybody wants to be a rock star. <laughs> so I think that, you know, I, I, I had the opportunity, and, and, and I would say to myself, this is it. Don't fail me now. Yeah. <laughs> Go and do it. Wow. It's amazing that you didn't ever choke in those situations because that would have just floored me each yeah, time. Yeah, I don't know what it was. I just I just had a lot of guts, I guess, is what it was. You yeah. know? Uh, I just had the opportunity. How could you not take advantage of an opportunity? And that's what I did. Yeah. I want to jump off career a little bit, go into personal life. Married 40 years. Yeah, yeah. And that's a 41, actually. Yeah. 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 How? Why do so many showbiz marriages not make it? Why did yours make it? You just got to hang in there. You know, it's like <laughs> what you just asked me. You know, there's good and bad. You know, marriage is tough. Uh, fortunately, I have a wonderful wife. I love her dearly. She's great looking. She's, she's fashionable. She's, she's everything. And she's a great mom. I mean, we have eight kids <laughs> in 10 years. You know. Wow. Uh, so I'm very fortunate. And again, you know, the good times, the bad times. The, the, I think what I learned from my background, from being my mom and my dad, were dedicated to one another, respected one another. And if there were falling outs or whatever it may be, you know, there was always getting back together again. There, in our society, through the years, hey, this doesn't work. I'm leaving. Talk to your attorney. Talk to your attorney. Yeah. You know, we just, uh, you got to learn how to apologize, accept apology. And as long as there's that real dedication of love, I think the marriage can go on and on and on until death do us part. You know? Yeah. I know that we are running out of time. And one area I don't want to miss, I know I'm skipping over the beach movies and all of that, but Greece in the 70s, amazing for you. It is amazing, and, uh, you know, I'd seen the show back in 1972 when it, when it was on Broadway. I did a promotion. I was playing the Copacabana at the days because, you know, I was trying to get myself into another area, you know, get out of the 50s and become, you know, Frank Sinatra and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I went and did a promotion, saw the play, and I, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was very good at the time. And then time goes by, 1977, uh, I'm playing golf, and I get off the golf course, and for the first nine holes, and my manager's there, and he says, i got a script Paramount wants you. They want you for this picture. I said, what is it? He said, Grease. I said, what's the role? He said, uh, Teen Angel. I said, Teen or not? Tell him no. <laughs> I said, why? I said, because I saw, I saw the play, and I know the character. You know, it's an extension of Elvis, and, you know, I don't do that style. It's a black leather jacket, long sideburns, and you know, he does this doo-wop kind of stuff. It's not me. Okay play the backside, come back in again. He's still there. He said, they won't take no. I said, what do you mean? He said, they want to talk with you. I said, all right, set up an appointment. So we go to Paramount, and I meet with the director, Randall Kleiser, Patty Birch, Alan Carr. And they say, why don't you want to do this? And I give them the same reason. And they say, no, 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 no. You're going to be all in white. You're going to have all of these girls around you. All in white, you come out of the clouds. And you sing to this girl. I said, that's it. I'll do it. That's the best thing I ever did. Yeah. Were you amazed at the success that followed that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I said to them when I was doing it, I said, you know, the one thing, guys, I, I, I really want you to handle this the right way. I don't want to, when I come on the screen, be a joke. Because I had been around for 20 years. I'm almost 40 at the time when I'm doing that picture. So I said, I don't want to be a joke. So they said, no, we're going to handle it just right. So the first review, and I have it laminated in my, one of my rooms there, <clears throat> that Liz Smith wrote and said, when Frankie Avalon appears on the screen, the audience went wild. And when Frankie Avalon leaves the screen, the audience applauded. So they really did their job. Yeah. And I'm very proud of it. Wow. And how do you follow that up? You don't. You just let it be a... Just, 
Yeah, how do you follow up uh, anything that you, you know you do from your heart, and you you you, you don't expect it to. This is going to be great. You just go do it, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, again, the good Lord goes boop. Yeah. There you go. Okay. What do you want to do now? At this point in your life, what do you look at and say, that's something I'd like to explore? What would I like to explore? As far as my business is concerned, I, I'm very fortunate to have really been involved in all aspects of it, from records to movies to television, my own shows, uh, specials, uh, uh, Broadway. Uh, I, I mean, I've really done... I just enjoy what I'm doing right now and enjoy my grandkids. We've got eight grandkids, another one on the way. I still enjoy playing golf with my cronies. And they keep taking my money all the time. They keep getting worse. <laughs> and uh, I just enjoy life and uh, take it as it comes. Well, I think I have to end here because of time, but I want to say thank you very much. Thank Pleasure you. talking with my you. Pleasure. Thank you. Frankie Avalon. 